Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Matt Kelher. I am a district council board member for uh, Como Park. Uh, welcome to the uh, second Sunday series in our 2022 uh, program. Uh, today, we're joined with some Ramsey County uh, Master Gardeners, uh, and uh, we're all looking forward to learning some new things. Uh, uh, each year, Como Community Council puts on a number of Sunday presentations called the Sunday Series, and this year's series will run each Sunday through March 27th at 1 p.m., uh, and you can find a full schedule on our website, comopark.org, uh, and I will momentarily put that link in the chat. Um, you can also find it on our Facebook page and in our weekly emails. Um, yeah, and at the end of today's presentation, <coughs> we'll use the remaining time for question and answers. Um, but uh, please keep your microphones muted during the presentation uh, to avoid any accidental interruptions. Um, and uh, we will also be recording today's presentation um, to uh, eventually use elsewhere, probably on our YouTube page uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, so I'm going to hand it off to some of our master gardeners here to uh, take it away. Um, I believe there are a few of them on the call today. And I, um, so my yeah. name is Mariah. I'm the, the lead presenter and I'm joined by um, Tiffa and Liz who will be helping watch behind the scenes and do things like that. Um, I need, um, can you make me a co-host so I can share my screen? Um, I think Mike Ireland might have to do that. Because I don't believe I am a host, so I can try. Hold on. <laughs> but I think you have to do that, Mike. Sorry about that. Mariah, okay. are you familiar with doing that, sharing a screen? I've never been the one to, to or, well, I, I know how to share the screen, but I don't know how to make it so I can, so. <laughs> oh, there I'm on an iPad and there are just not that many. Anyone jump in and feel free to. No, okay, I, I see the share screen button, so I'll see if I can get this to go. Yeah, if you try that, it probably will work. Mike just might have to approve. There we go. And it works. Oh my goodness. Okay. okay. All right. So I'll let you take it away from here, Mariah. Thank you uh, for being here. Okay. So what we're talking about today is pruning trees and shrubs. Um, and who we are as master gardeners, um, we work with the University of Minnesota Extension, and we're just a, a volunteer <gasps> program. Um, and we like to share uh, research-based horticultural information. Excuse me a minute. Honey, calm down. I'm dog sitting, so, <laughs> but um, yeah. So we are volunteers who uh, share research-based information um, to, to the community just because we want people to have success in their gardens based on something more than my grandma said something once. So, uh, and our program has multiple priorities. Uh, this, this falls under horticultural skills. Um, and we've got classes on a variety of, of different things that fall under these categories. So uh, this presentation is split up into a couple of sections. Um, so we're gonna start with a little bit of tree anatomy, tree biology sort of stuff. Um, then to help us understand what's going on with trees that will inform why we prune and how we prune later. Um, there are section breaks in here. And so I like to get through a section. And then if you have questions, you can feel free to put them in the chat and we'll answer them at breaks or if at the break, if you wanna unmute and answer questions, we'll do that too. So, um, so getting into, tree anatomy. So we're all familiar with what a tree looks like, right? But uh, we sort of have this idea or have been taught this idea that what a tree looks like above ground is what it looks like below ground. And that's sort of true, but um, the roots of a tree actually don't go down as far as that traditional mirror image tells us. They're much shallower and much farther out. So they can be up to two times out from the canopy or like as wide as the canopy is, they can be like two times as wide as that. And they're generally in the top six to 24 inches of soil. Um, they're, we don't see them, so we don't think about them a lot, but it has a lot to do with 
how healthy a tree is and that can play into the pruning that we will do. So, um, you know, you, you can sometimes tell if the, the soil is having a bad time and that might result in the roots having a bad time. Um, if you know that there's a lot of salt involved, um, chemicals, any construction nearby, um, those sorts of things affect our roots, which will affect the whole tree. And side, then, then we've got the big trunk, uh, which from the outside in goes the bark and then the cambium layer, which is where that's like the really thin living tissue situation that causes the tree to get bigger and move stuff up and down. Now within the cambium, we've got the phloem, which transports, sort of takes stuff from, from below and mixes it with stuff from up top and then brings it to where it needs to be in the tree. Um, and then there's the xylem, which is what just brings the water and things from the soil that you get from the roots up to interact with the photosynthesis things up higher. Um, trunks are able to be damaged as well as crowns. So, you know, if you're looking at a tree and thinking about its health, which is important when we start to make uh, considerations for pruning, um, you might want to look and see if there's any damage from lawnmowers. Um, you know, you can get some, some weather damage. Um, and then there's obviously damage from insects and uh, small things like rabbits and voles. And then we get to the top of the tree, which is technically called the crown. Uh, this includes leaves, twigs, all of the branches, flowers, and fruit. Um, this is a pretty important part of the tree because where the leaves are is where the stuff from the roots interacts with the stuff from the sun. Um, so it's this this has a large role to play in in our figuring out how how to prune, how much we can prune that sort of thing. And here again, this is something that can be acted on by forces other than ourselves. We see a lot of wind or snow damage in crowns of trees. And often if you have a tree that is stressed by disease or insects, you'll start seeing it in the crown first before you see it lower down in the tree. So how trees grow? There are these sections called meristems and that's, that's kind of like that cambium layer. It's really thin and it's right on the outside. Um, you can kind of think of it as the sapwood. That's, that's where trees are growing from. And so there are two important meristems. We have lateral meristems, and those are the ones that are more or less a circle. And that's what lets our trees get bigger sideways. And apical meristems, which is the, the portion of the tree that grows at the tips of twigs and things. So that's really important for when we're pruning because there are chemicals and things going on in these, these buds where that apical meristem, where it's growing up and out, there are chemicals in there that it knows to do that. And if you remove that, it's gonna cause a chemical reaction in the buds that remain there. And that, you know, that can be helpful if you want to direct growth in a certain way, but can also come across or have the tree do kind of strange things if we are not pruning as intentionally. In terms of branches and how they interact with the trunk, um, there's these important, a couple important areas that are helpful to know and not always necessarily easy to find. We have what's called the trunk collar, uh, which is where, so, Trunk wood is expanding outward. Branch wood is basically a trunk, but just sideways, and that's expanding outward. So where those two expansions of wood intersect, there's twice as much wood. So we get a fatter, like a small section of ring that's a little bit fatter at the base of a branch. And that's called the branch collar. And if things are going correctly, because we've got two interacting little parts of the tree, their bark should come together 
and then kind of push out and against each other. And you'll see what's called the bark ridge, which is, you know, in, in the union, you should see sort of like mountains like that rough bark coming out. And <laughs> as with most things in nature, there are exceptions to this. And we'll get back to that later, but branch collar and branch bark ridge are, are important for, to know about for when we prune later, but they're not always super easy to see. So there, that you can see here, this is a good example where the branch collar is pretty obvious. And then the bark ridge, and the bark ridge isn't only on the top, it extends down the sides too. Okay, that was kind of quick and a lot of information. Um, does anybody have any questions? Seem like there are any in the chat yet. Okay. So moving on to reasons to prune. Uh, so I think often if we're looking to prune a tree or shrub, we know why we want to prune. And, um, and that's good, but there are other uh, considerations to make um, other than like, this is getting in the way when I mow my lawn. So here are some of those. So there are trees that like to grow with multiple stems, which is unfortunate because they're not supposed to. Um, wood is not, like branch unions are much, much stronger if they form horizontally rather than vertically. So codominant leads is something where you have um, branches that are pretty much the same size. And it doesn't have to be just two. You can have more than that, but usually it's two or three. Um, and they are, it's essentially like two trees coming out of one tree. And you, what you'll see is that they have a very V-shaped union. And we don't see the branch bark collar because it doesn't have one because they both think that they're the main stem. And often they lack a branch bark ridge also because there's just, they're not interacting in the correct way. And so they're just like two popsicle sticks next to each other, but they're also growing and pushing into each other. And so this makes for a very weak structure in the tree. And if we catch it early enough, you're able to slow it down or remove that, that weak growth. Similarly, we can see the same sort of, um, very tight V shape with the, the poor branch bark situation with our regular branches. Um, as a general point, the wider the branch union is, the stronger it is. Um, that's a really easy way to look at it, but a wide branch union can still not be great. And so that's why it's important to look at the bark. Um, so in this picture, the bottom union to the left, you can see that's, that's wider and we can see that branch bark collar there. Whereas this middle union and sort of more towards the top of this picture, you can see instead of the bark of those two uh, branches or leads coming together and kind of pushing up like mountains, what we get instead is it's just kind of like it's sucked in and those, those two pieces of wood are not interacting and connecting to each other. They're just right against each other, like, like my two hands. And so in that union, there isn't anything holding it together. And so it's more likely to split. We can also prune weak growth. And what does that mean? So um, if you see a tree with just like a flush of whippy stems. Um, you'll see this often if you have pruned previously that you'll get suckers or sprouts on old pruning wounds. Crab apples like this top picture are, they, they often get a lot of sprouts. And then sometimes you see them from the base like on the bottom. Um, so what's weak about these is they grow, if you ever look really closely at them, the new growth on there is like a foot. It's just like a lot. And so that's really fast grown wood and we're not seeing that strong branch attachment like you would with a regular branch where layers of wood 
it's like when you shuffle a deck of cards and you get layers on top of layers. We do not see that in water sprouts, which are what it's called when they're from the branches or suckers from the base. Um, so this can be sort of normal, but sometimes if you see them in just like oodles and oodles, like there's just a butt ton of them, that's likely because the tree is stressed. Um, and they'll grow sometimes in clumps, sometimes just like in a line up of trunks or stems. Um, and they grow straight up because they're gunning for the sun. And um, if you see, if you have a tree like this bottom picture where it's got a lot of suckers from the base, um, I, in, in my experience, that means that that tree is more stressed than suckers up further in the canopy. Um, and it could also be that the trees is planted at the improper depth. Um, so these are things that we can prune out, but it, you may also want to pay attention to how the tree reacts to it or what happens with it in the future, because it could mean that the tree is experiencing stress from insects or drought or something like that. Rubbing branches. So not all trees do this, um, but uh, trees that are likely to do this, maples and lindens have really thick crowns. So often their branches grow and just rub against each other. Um, or you have a species like honey locust, for example, that their branches are just going in all sorts of weird directions. And so they might run into each other. And so you'll see as they're small, they rub against each other and the, the wood gets a little bit lighter. And eventually it rubs through that outer bark layer and through the cambium and you'll start to get a wound and um, it, it tries to heal it a little bit. You might see a little bit of that callus around that wound, but eventually with that constant rubbing, you're losing that, that layer of movement tissue in the tree. And so like the top half or whatever of that branch will be not as functional. So if we don't deal with this, it can kill whole branches or make them structurally less sound. Um, and I, I have also seen where it's bad enough that a, a branch grows around another branch or, you know, I think we've all seen where a tree has grown around a fence and it kind of looks like, hey, they'll be fine. But really, you know, knowing where that, how important that cambium layer is for transporting water and nutrients and things through the tree, we know that if that's cut off or rubbed away, that's a weak spot. Um, in a similar vein, uh, trees can sometimes get what's called girdling roots, which is where the root, for whatever reason, comes back around and runs right along the trunk. And as the trunk grows out and it, the root grows up, they run into each other and it starts to just kind of strangle itself. Um, often they're not as obvious as what we see in this picture on the bottom. Um, you would maybe see like a flat side of the tree or sometimes they kind of look like an elephant's foot. Um, those are much more challenging to deal with. Um, the best way to deal with those is to, if you're bu uh, buying something from a nursery and planting something, then really check that root ball, see what's going on there. If you have anything that's actively around the trunk or looking like it's gonna get there, that's something you have more success with preemptively than after it started happening. Obviously, we want to prune our trees if they are damaged. Um, you know, whether that's strong winds, you know, we get a bunch of icy stuff on our trees and they split, they get hit by lightning, etc. cetera. Um, in the case of this tree, I think based on, uh, it looks like there's some rot at the top of it. So this is, is kind of what happens if you have those bad unions where that bark is on the inside as compared to pushed out on the outside. And so you see stuff just gets stuck in there and water gets in and it starts to rot. And then when it's under stress, like with weather, then it just splits. Um, sometimes these things aren't as extreme as we see in this picture. You might notice trees starting to split before they actually split all the way. And unless it's a super, super small tree, um, you know, where like, Hey, a school bus drove by and broke off this little branch on um, this tree that just got planted in the boulevard. Often 
storm damage is something that um, should be dealt with by an arborist uh, who is able to deal with the, the tension and whatever is going on in that tree safely. Um, and, you know, depending on the degree to which the tree is damaged, sometimes you're able to remove the damage and in such a way that the tree will be able to heal over it. And sometimes the whole tree has to go. Um, so if we have broken branches, depending on the size, we can prune those out. There are cracks in the trunk. That's something where you might be able to prune some of the weight off in hopes that it is less likely to split, but it's definitely something to watch. Um, if we see movement of the roots, um, so sometimes trees grow sideways, and that's entirely different than a tree that started upright and starts to tip over. So if we're seeing a tree that's in the ground and the ground is pretty flat and it's growing sideways, that's fine. Trees do this cool thing where they grow different kinds of wood to help support them if they're growing sideways. But if we have an upright tree and the root plate starts coming up, that's something that we need to be concerned about. Uh, another thing that can damage a tree is decay. And this is something that, depending on what sort of decay it is, sometimes you can prune it out and sometimes you can't. So um, decay gets in through the protective bark and there are different kinds of decay because there's decay that feeds on live stuff and decay that feeds on dead stuff. And so you might see in the canopy of your tree that there's a dead branch and it's got little frilly black stuff coming out of it. That's the decay that we can deal with. That's a saprophyte, we can cut it out, that's great. If it's like heartwood rot or root rot and you see like little roots coming up from, or little <laughs> mushrooms coming up from the, where you, the roots of your tree are, that's not something that you can really prune to do anything about. Um, and yeah, so there's, de there's decay that makes the wood spongy and some of it that affects different parts of it. So it's just more brittle and you don't really need to know what sort of fungus you have. It's just a matter of, you know, if it's on a dead branch, you can probably remove the dead branch, but if you're seeing fruiting bodies on the trunk, that may be worth asking someone who knows more about these things to find out like, hey, does that mean this has, you know, sapwood rot and this is gonna affect this tree or heartwood rot and we need to be thinking about pruning it or removing it. Um, similarly, we get infections in trees, whether that's insects, fungi, bacteria, viruses, um, insects, you can't necessarily prune out because they're probably everywhere. Uh, fungi, it depends, and bacteria and viruses. I don't, I think those are pretty in there biologically, but what we have in this picture is called black knot and it's often found on uh, like cherry trees and things like that. And with something as obvious as this, you can often prune a lot of it out, but it isn't necessarily going to remove the infection. Um, you might notice different kinds of infections will like start on leaf tips. You might get some like crispy brown leaves earlier than they should be or some a little bit of uh, twigs curling up a little and that's that's more likely a fungus, a fungal sort of infection. And to an extent you can prune those out but if you're pruning out an infection, what's really important is that as you go, you need to be cleaning your tools. Otherwise you could unintentionally be spreading the infection from one part of the tree to another. Um, and yeah, so if a tree has an infection, it's probably stressed. And so you might see water, water sprout growth. Um, you might see dieback in the crown, which is you know, related to how infections work in a tree, they kind of start at, it starts at the tips and um, affects how the tree is able to move water and photosynthesis, photosynthates throughout the tree. So it starts dying back from the tips um, because they're not always as obvious as, as this picture. We can prune to remove deadwood. Uh, so it's not unusual for trees to have deadwood. 
there are some trees that ash trees have a fair amount of deadwood and they'll hold on to it for a while. Um, birches have deadwood all the time and they just, you know, the wind blows and it comes out. So it's good to remove it uh, because otherwise you don't have any control over when it comes down or, you know, if slash what it's gonna hit. Um, and it, it also seems that if you remove the deadwood, uh, so a tree will shed deadwood by itself, but if we remove it, it's more likely to be removed in such a way that it'll heal over better and quicker. Um, so deadwood is obvious sometimes and not obvious other times. So if you see something dead because it doesn't have leaves on it and you want to remove it and you're not sure you'll remember where it is later, you can always flag it so you can remove it in the winter or remove it then. Um, because having not green leaves makes it obvious. Um, buds will not form if it's dead or if you bend something and it's really brittle, that, that'll tell you it's dead as well. Um, but I, the easiest way is definitely if it's really crispy and it has started to break, then you know it's dead or if the leaves are gone, so. Um, and the, you can chase after as much deadwood as you want, but generally two inches is kind of like the main cutoff point where if you have something two inches or greater, then you really need to get it out because it's more, it's considered most hazardous after it's bigger than two inches. Mm -hmm. And in a positive light, <laughs> we can prune stuff because we want it to grow differently. So as we talked about, if we're snipping buds off of those apical mare stems, tree chemical things happen and then new buds get to grow. And so maybe we want to encourage something to flower or to fruit. So um, there is a lot of intentionality behind when you want to prune fruit trees um, and where you want to prune them to because you know, understanding how the tree reacts to that, you can get it to flush out more or, you know, remove older wood because it might uh, produce on newer wood. And that's all plant dependent because, um, you know, like raspberries are specific and apples are specific, things like that. Um, and in this example, you can also do this with bonsai things because then you can keep it small but understanding enough so that you keep the the growth even it still looks nice um and this this is a form of pruning where we are working in um healthy plant material which can be different than some of the things we already spoke about okay so any questions on why we want to prune uh, yes, there's a great question about infections and uh -huh. how to and um, they ask how thoroughly do tools need to be cleaned and the best disposal of trimmed material. That is a very good question. Um, so <sighs> I don't want to say it depends, but that it it depends. So the different infections are more virulent than other infections. Um, and so if you wanna get into the nitty gritty and figure out what you have and how bad it is, you could do that. Otherwise I would suggest you can get, um, you can have like a 10% bleach solution and clean something, a saw or pruners in between every cut or um, I've used like bleach wipes before. Um, and, and then with the plant material, there again, it depends on what it is for where you can dispose of it because if it's not super serious, you can compost it, but then there are some things like um, if you're pruning, I think the, the, the best example would be you don't, ooh, I'm coming up with more examples. So like oak wilt is something where that material needs to be contained, otherwise it can spread because it's got fungal spores that will continue to be viable for two years. Um, not, not that if you prune something with oak wilt, oak wilt usually kills things, but um, so I think that that would be something where you need to like research and look into 
where your disposal disposal options are um, because a county like compost site may not accept disease materials but on the flip side a home composting situation might not get hot enough to kill those pathogens so it may be that you just have to throw it in the garbage um, so i would say if you're not sure what sort of infection you have the safest bet would be to throw it in the garbage um, uh, otherwise, I would say if it is accepted at a uh, county composting site, that would probably be better because then you don't risk keeping that in your landscape space. So, okay. So, pruning techniques. Number one, we've got crown cleaning. So this is exactly what it sounds like. We're going into the crown of a tree and we're taking out stuff that's doing bad things. So that's dead or dying branches, stuff that's diseased. And then that would be a good, uh, a good case for us removing weakly attached, attached branches, whether that's those suckers or water sprouts. Or if we see those poor branch unions, we're able to clean those out of the crown then. Um, and you can see in this picture, it, it looks a little cleaner, but there wasn't a whole lot of, um, between the before and after, there's not a whole lot of difference in, in structure all that much. So we're just getting rid of stuff that's bad. Crown thinning is a little bit different. Um, this is more so to improve the structure, make it so that we get better airflow and light into the canopy. Um, this is super, super helpful to prevent disease because fungus and, and biological things really like damp and airless spaces. So um, thinning is also very intentional about, hey, if we have two branches stacked on top of each other, they don't need to be that close, we'll get rid of those. It is not, however, this one branch has a lot of little branches on it and I'm gonna whack a bunch of these twigs off. So crown thinning, we have to be very careful to um, get rid of enough material that there, it's more light and airy, but we wanna you know, keep, keep it balanced. So we've got trees going in all directions and we're trying to avoid making holes but we don't wanna to go too far, either removing too much material entirely or removing it so there's just a little tuft on the end. Um, that's called lion's tailing. Trees don't like that. Um, it's, it's harder on, on the branch if it only has the live stuff at the end and it'll make it kind of more challenging to prune later because you've taken away a bunch of options. Um, and so in thinning, um, cleaning was more removal of dead stuff. Thinning, you can remove the dead stuff if it's in the way, but we're also getting into some trimming of live tissue. Crown raising, really simple. We're creating clearance at the bottom of the tree so we're not getting slapped in the face. So I think we all have this idea that trees, like we have a tree and it kind of grows up from the ground, but where it actually grows up from is the tip. And so the branches that are four feet from the ground are gonna be four feet from the ground forever. So crown raising, we know that this branch four feet from the ground is gonna be here forever and it's not gonna somehow magically move up as the tree grows. So if we need more than four feet from the ground, whether that's for it's too close to a building, we don't wanna get hit in the face when we're mowing the lawn, it's in front of a stop sign, etc. We're taking those lowest branches off so that we have enough space to do what we need to do. Um, what's important about crown raising is that we don't go super hard on small trees. So we need, uh, it, it's very tempting if you come up to a small tree to raise the crown up to where you want it to be immediately. But sometimes we have to do it in small pieces. So that might be, I'll, I'll talk more about this later, um, but just, cutting it back a little so it puts less energy into that branch and removing it later. Um, sometimes we're able to remove 
everything and get the correct clearance that we want, but sometimes it takes a little while. Crown reduction is, is taking a treat and sucking it in a little. Um, this only works for a little bit because a tree is going to be as big as a tree is going to be. So it makes it easier on everybody if you're thinking about planting a tree to make sure it will fit in the space that you have. Um, because we, we can prune back so it still looks like a tree and we take a little bit of that size away, but it's just gonna keep growing back. So um, this is something that you will often see uh, with trees that are interacting with power lines. Um, and I don't know how much people see on the boulevards of St. Paul where sometimes trees are planted under low power lines and they reduce them and kind of they just get V-shaped in the middle and just like thickety and sad looking. So that's, that shows you, you can kind of bring it back a little, but ultimately the tree is gonna win. So. so with that in mind, here's how we should prune so that the trees can handle it most best. <laughs> so thinning cuts uh, removes something to its point of origin. As compared to a reduction cut, where we're essentially, we're taking a big branch and we're making it into a smaller branch. Uh, so thinning cuts, that's something that we would use to remove something that's dead or damaged. We're taking that all the way back to where it started from. Uh, whereas a reduction cut, that's something more likely for us to use if we're trying to reduce a canopy. Um, or this is kind of what I talked about with cutting off the lowest branches, you can make the branch a little bit smaller before you cut it off entirely. Um, and what's, what's important about this is we're cutting back to the appropriate place. So when we're making a thinning cut and removing all of the material, it's pretty easy to find where it came from and cut it off there. A reduction cut, we need to make sure that we're not just willy nilly making a cut and leaving a branch stub. Um, the idea with a reduction cut is you remove it back to what you're removing. What is left should be a, at least one third of the size of what you're removing because we're taking away those that um, apical meristem situation and having the, the plant chemicals go to what we left and that will now be the main growing point for that branch. So it's really important that what is left is large enough to take on that main growing role. So in this picture on the bottom, the thinning cut is to the brick or the trunk. That's the thinning cut. Next out, we have a stub cut, which we do not want because we've essentially just killed what is left of that branch. And because it's so far out, it's not going to heal. Moving over to the further to the right, we have a reduction cut where we took a section of the branch and we cut it back to live tissue that can take over growing for what we cut out. And finally, farthest out, we have a heading cut, which we also do not want. That is when we prune back to something that is too small to take over growing what we removed. Uh, so there is also, so heading cuts uh, sort of just, just caps off the growth and trees freak out about it. And then they sprout like crazy then we get what's called witch's brooms. And as we talked about earlier, that, is, that sort of growth is not good. It's, it's not strongly attached. It's pretty ugly. It's, it's not healthy for the tree at all. Um, so heading, heading and stubbing cuts both sort of lead to that witch's brooming. Um, it makes the tree more stressed out and ultimately is going to result in more damage later because it's creating wood that isn't gonna stay on the tree. Uh, in terms of shrubs, and this also depends on the kind of shrub, not all trees can be, or not all shrubs can be rejuvenation pruned, but uh, shrubs like lilacs, for example, you can do this if you've got a lilac that's just huge and out of control and not blooming very well. Organized 
So then we have this big, this big shrub and we're able to, to prune it to be healthier as we go by removing a third of it as a time. So we see that at first we just have this ridiculous shrub. And then the first year we remove a third of it and we leave two thirds of it. And the next year we have new sprouts and better growth from the base of what we removed before. So then you remove the next third of what the old stuff was. We, the next year we get that new flush of growth again. And by the third year, you've removed all the oldest wood. And what you have left is more contained, often flowery or growth. Any questions on any of that? Uh, it doesn't seem to be, there don't, there aren't any uh, questions in the chat right now. Perfect. Okay, so now getting into what we all wanna know, how we should prune. So timing, in a perfect world, according to how trees work in the climate that we are in where we have winter, late winter or early spring is the best time to prune. This is helpful for us because we can see what's going on in there. Um, we don't have to worry about insects or disease because that's all not happening in the winter. And if we prune in the late winter or early spring, when spring comes, that flush of sap and growth will heal more rapidly. Uh, conversely, the worst time to cut woody plants would then be opposite of that, so like the late fall, um, because we're making those wounds and the tree is focusing on shutting down and taking everything back in and down to the roots as compared to putting it out. Um, we also do not want to prune things in their first year of growth. And generally, we don't want to prune something if you just planted it. Um, obviously, if you, oh, Obviously, if you bring something home from the nursery and there's something on it that's broken, feel free to snip some of that out. But the transplant stress is enough for that tree. We don't need to be making pruning cuts on it. Um, also, if something is super damaged or diseased, pruning isn't going to save it. Removal is really your only option. And as with all things, <laughs> there are exceptions to this. Um, and so this is winter being the best time. That doesn't mean that you can't prune other times. It's just if you want to do what's best for your woody plants, then pruning it before it can, before the spring so it can heal better is, is your optimal time. Equipment wise, uh, it depends on what you're pruning. But I would say if you have two tools for sure in your pruner belt, it would be a hand pruners and a hand saw. So hand pruners are for stuff that's less than three quarters of an inch because you could try and cut something bigger, but I can tell you, you're gonna have a bad time. Um, so we, there are two different kinds of pruners. There's the anvil pruners where there's a blade that comes against this, something solid. And then there's more like the scissors type pruners. Um, some of them cut better than others, but ultimately you're gonna get done what you need to get done. Uh, the loppers have longer handles, so you're able to have more leverage and cut larger things up to an inch and a half. And then if you're into anything bigger than an inch, what you're gonna need is a pruning saw. Um, arborist saws cut on a pole as compared to uh, carpenter saws, which cut on the push. So you could use whatever sort of saw you have, but I think you can be more exact with a, uh, an arborist pruning saw. Um, and then some shrubs, you might want a head shears for, you can get either like the giant scissors ones or there are um, gas powered ones. And you can use those for like arborvitae hedges and things like that. And as we mentioned briefly earlier, uh, cleaning is really important. Um, it, it allows the tools to last longer and is gonna let your pruning be better for the plants in the long run. Um, you know, we don't want a bunch of sap stuck to something, then a bunch of dirt getting stuck there and then they get rusty and dull and it's just a bad time for everyone. So, um, you know, at the very least, um, clean your tools up really well at the end of the season. And then in, at the beginning of the season, sharpen them really well. Um, if you are working with anything that is diseased 
or you're worried about transferring bad stuff from one plant to the other, make sure you're disinfecting them. Um, and you, as I said, you can do that with a 10% bleach solution. If it's just regular dirt, you know, good old fashioned dish soap and just giving it a good scrub will work. Um, and, you know, depending on how often you're using it or what you're using it for, sharpen your sharpen stuff at least yearly. Uh, if you're using a hand pruners and you're getting a bunch of dirt in it, obviously you're going to need to sharpen it more often, but it'll just, you know, it's better for the plant and easier on you if your equipment is clean and sharp. So removing small branches uh, with our hand pruners, we want to make sure that as we talked about, we're not just stubbing it off somewhere. So we wanna come back to where approximately where we wanna be and find a bud. And then we don't not wanna cut straight across. If we're cutting to a single bud, we kinda of want a, a 45 degree angle because that helps us prevent accidentally nipping that bud. We don't wanna have it be too far of an angle. Otherwise that's just a little bit too much material that will eventually be dead and kind of decay-y and that'll affect its ability to grow from that bud. And uh, if we have a place where we have two opposite buds, then that would be a case for cutting straight across, but making sure that we're leaving enough space that we don't nip those buds either. When we get into larger things, especially on trees, or if you're removing something that's kind of long or heavy, uh, there's a three-step process that works really well. We start with an undercut on the bottom, kind of, I don't know, like six or more inches away from where you ultimately want to cut back to. And then cut two, we you know, start at the top, cut all the way through, and removes the bulk of the material. And the final cut is where we want that, that pruning to be ultimately at the end. So the reason we do this is different woody things have a different degree of how much they tear. And so if you just go for it and you make a cut, the weight of it will cause it to, to break. And then that living cambium tissue and bark is still attached and will just rip down with the branch and keep going down the trunk. And then we have, you know, you go from having sort of like a circular wound to having like a really long oblong wound. And that's not what we want. And so if we do that undercut first, when we make that second cut, it can still tear, but that undercut is going to stop it. And then all we have left is a little stub. And so that final cut, we're going to pay attention to where that branch bark ridge is and where that trunk collar is, because the bark ridge tells us where we should start our cut and the trunk collar kind of tells us where we should make it. Because Trees do all this really cool thing where if they have this, this interaction between the trunk and the branch, they, they're able to deal with that decay. There's something called the branch protection zone where in, in that fat trunk collar tissue, it'll be like, oh, we something's got cut off. And so then they start freaking out and do some sort of chemical magic and, and stop it from decaying further into the tree. And so it's really important that we don't accidentally cut off that trunk collar. Um, and it, it can look a little bit weird because it kind of seems kind of stubby if we're leaving the trunk collar, which we should as compared to like cutting right along the trunk. But this minimizes the size of the pruning cut we're making. So it heals faster and then also leaves what the tree needs to compartmentalize that decay that is, will come along. So when we're moving large branches with that three cut method, so we can see here on this picture that, that we started with the undercut, removed the bulk of the material with that second cut, and it did tear back, but it stopped at that first cut. And here using that pruning saw to make the final cut. Um, large branches are really good for those thinning cuts where we're removing whole branches. And they're also really good for um, reduction cuts. So if you're reducing something, it, it will never hurt for you to do a three cut pruning method as compared to just going for the one cut because we don't want to cause those tear outs. And so then recovery. Here's a picture. We're looking for that, that donut shaped callus 
And so we can see here that that's pretty round. And so we know that that, that cut was made at a pretty appropriate place. And um, if, if we accidentally cut off some of that trunk collar where that, that good healing wood is, sometimes it doesn't grow over as well. And so here we see that it's healing pretty evenly all the way in. Um, so that's, that's a sign of a good pruning cut. Um, trees don't heal so much as we do. They're, they, they contain sort of, they, they take the wound and they grow around it. And then if there's, in the time it takes to callus over, there's often a little bit of decay that gets in there just because that's the nature of wood. But if we do our cuts in a healthy fashion, then biologically the tree is able to sort of put a bubble around it and keep the decay from spreading. Um, wound sealing is not recommended. Um, they used to put all sorts of things on wounds, whether, you know, they used to fill trees with concrete and like put netting over holes and things like that. And that's just no longer recommended. Um, it, instead of, you know, it's not like a bandaid where it's just like keeps it covered until the tree can deal with it. Wound dressings are more like, we're going to take a bunch of stuff and hold it here and the tree's not going to know what to do with it. And it's going to be a bad time. Um, so the exception to this being, if we have um, rose stem borers, you can put like a little dab of glue to keep them from getting in if you're doing some pruning on your roses. Otherwise, if we are pruning oaks um, in the summer, we wanna put a, a wound sealant on that um, so that oak wilt fungi can't get in, um, which is to say, we're not pruning our oaks in the summer. It's more of a, if there was storm damage and we go in to fix okay. better oh. prune that storm damage out, then we wanna put some sealant on there really? um, to keep the fungus out. And that's um, like a polyurethane you can use for that. Otherwise leave it be because the tree can deal with its healing on its own. So when do we know that pruning is not gonna work and we need to remove a tree? Um, if the tree is more than 50% gone, if you look at a canopy and you see a bunch of dead sticky stuff in it and like whole branches are dead, you can't prune that out and expect that tree to survive. Um, if you have really bad cracks or like if you have a crack and you can put your hand in it, pruning isn't going to solve that. If there is, you know, like a big decay hollow in a tree, pruning isn't going to solve that. And um, that's when removal is more appropriate. Um, it, we, it says here, if there's a bunch of disease or insects, um, that can be sort of hard to tell that it's disease or insects, but what you'll, you'll, what you'll see is that the canopy is declining. You'll see those sticks starting to die or have like a lot of dead branches. And so if you get to that 50% crown loss, then you know it's gotta go. Um, Sometimes if you talk to an arborist and they know specifically what sort of disease or insect it is, they might be more ready to tell you that the tree has to go like oak wilt or Dutch elms disease. Those things are so transmissible that you just have to get rid of it. So, then speaking of arborists, um, arborists are really good tools. Um, they are certified by the International Society of Arboriculture. Um, so they have to know about tree biology and, and pests and safe tree work practices. Um, often they know a lot about tree diseases, tree health things, uh, so they can give you a good idea of what's going on with your tree, if you're able to prune it, if you should remove it, that sort of thing. And they also have access to equipment that um, homeowners might not. Uh, if you're looking for an arborist, there are literally hundreds of tree care companies in the Twin Cities, um, but it's helpful to look for that ISA certification or the um, uh, Tree Care Industry Association, TCIA, will um, provide backing to people who have the correct training. Um, so those are good indications of um, certification and how professional folks are. Um, and I know you know, if 
you're concerned about boulevard things, depending on where you live, uh, like St. Paul and Minneapolis both have um, forestry crews. And so you don't always have to take care of a tree. You might be able to reach out and have someone else take care of it for you. Okay, so any questions on that? Uh, yes, yeah, so, uh, there's a question about, um, you know, where do you recommend uh, taking equipment for sharpening in general? Um, so like with a hand printers, if you just get a flat file, you can do that yourself. Um, with the shears, you could potentially do that with a flat file or like if you had a grinding wheel. Otherwise, I think that you would maybe be able to take it to a hardware store um, because I think you know, like they, they'll sharpen scissors. So I think that they would maybe be able to sharpen shears too. I'm not sure, but that would be my suggestion. Okay, excellent. And then um, we also need to do a poll and, um, and it's a little different because usually, you know, we have um, the Zoom, but uh, we're part of the uh, Como community today. And so um, when do you think would be a good time to have that poll go through? <laughs> I don't, I was thinking about this and I'm not sure how to do that, but okay. I mean, we could do it anytime. Okay, I wasn't sure if like after your parting considerations and just um, to give a heads up so that people didn't um, leave before the end of the poll because the poll is uh, very helpful for the um, master gardeners uh, to know who we're serving. Sure, yeah, I just, this uh, parting considerations is essentially one slide. So we, I'll talk through that quick and then we can do poll things. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Before we move on, can I ask a, a question? Cause you're, you had a slide about not pruning in late summer, but I have an apple tree and I was at a different book that advised that you should prune out the water sprouts in like mid August. Sure. Um, so just I'm curious to hear your thoughts since you yes. kind of were advising not to do that, so. Yeah, so that was the suggestion to only prune in the late winter or early spring is like a very broad, like, hey, in theory, the best time is then because you then get the best healing when spring things start happening. That isn't to say that you can't do things at other times. And so like with fruiting or flowering plants, often we have to prune at different times times like there's there's a fair amount of ornamental things that you have to prune in like June or July to get the best results from that so it's it's not a hard and fast rule it's more of a suggestion if that helps yep thank you mm -hmm. and there's um another are there a few more questions sure. um if there's an empty area of a linden tree is there a way to make a small slice on the branch that will encourage a new branch to grow? Um, if there is an empty area. So I think your best bet would be to look at the branches that are next to it and see if you could encourage those branches to grow into that hole. So if there is an area that's pretty bare and you go over to the next branch over and it's got some twigs heading in that direction, maybe you could do some reduction cuts to those twigs to encourage the tree to grow more towards filling in that hole. I think that would be my best suggestion. Uh, excellent. And then any thoughts on uh, regarding insect and bird friendliness when pruning? Um, it hasn't necessarily been some something I have thought about or seen much on. Um, I, I guess, you know, if, if you know that there are birds nesting in that tree, avoid pruning when they're active there. Um, and then like, I know that there are some creatures that will live in little hollows and trees and things. And sometimes it makes best sense structurally for the tree to remove those things. Um, but, you know, you could just keep an eye on it if you want to keep that cavity space there for things. Um, but, you know, like with, with insects, there are maybe some, some flowering considerations you could take into account. So like if you wanted your 
oh, um, hydrangeas to be more showy and flashy. There are, there are specific times you could prune so that you get that um, for pollinators and things, but otherwise I don't know of much pruning advice for birds. Gotcha. Um, and then um, when and how do you prune cherry trees? Are there any special consideration for, for cherry trees? <laughs> Is this uh, a cherry for production? That I'm not sure. Um, yeah, is it? Um, wait, I, I guess I, I don't know a, a whole lot about like orchard type pruning, but um, I think if you had a cherry tree and you're trying to get it to produce um, or be there for sort of like a food crop tree, my suggestion there would be to sort of do those those reduction cuts and pay attention to where branches are going so that you can kind of keep it at a level where you can access the fruit. Um, I don't know off the top of my head when cherries bloom or fruit, um, but there are, you know, specific fruit trees have specific pruning guidelines because they produce fruit on different ages of wood. And so then if you want to encourage fruit production, then it's it's either you prune in the spring or in the fall. And that relates to if it produces on new or old wood, which I don't know off the top of my head. Um, so that is just to say, if you're looking for fruit production, then you just need to figure out what type of wood it fruits on and then prune to encourage that, I would say. Okay. Yeah, uh, it, and um, it looks like it does, the, it, the tree produces a lot of cherries in early summer. So, but uh, it, it seems like it just really does depend on the type of wood. Yeah. Um, and then there's another question about, a, a lin, another question about a linden tree. Um, and it has a very large crack in it. And one tree company suggested removal and another suggested bolting and wiring. Um, can you talk a little bit about the differences um, and what this, like the pros and cons, I suppose? Sure. So um, if you have a tree and you really like it and you see some of these, these things we talked about that we're worried about, whether that's those like included branch unions that lead to cracks or, you know, that, well, that's, that's mostly it. Sometimes you are able to put a cable in the canopy of a tree, which then if it's a uh, steel cable, it, it sort of winches the canopy together and then it goes through branches and has stops on the end. So then you are holding together the portions of the canopy that are more, most likely to split. And you can reinforce that. So that happens about two thirds up of the way in the up into the canopy and you can reinforce that with a bolt down in the union. And that's just give a little bit of beefiness to the union to support the crack. It is not a fail safe. Um, it's, it's something to consider if you're trying to save a tree, but I have seen cables break. Um, and so, there are arborists who have certifications in um, tree risk assessment. And so they, someone with that is more able to look at the tree as a whole and figure out, you know, this crack is bad enough that cabling won't do it. Um, or, hey, we could cable this. So removal is valid, cabling is valid, um, but it's, you know, it's dependent on how attached you are to the tree, how healthy the tree is, if the tree is splitting and like, if it did split, it's gonna smash your garage, you know, that, that sort of thing. So both are valid things. It's just depends on what the tree is doing in the space that it's in, so. Great. And then uh, looks like we have one more question and then we'll, we'll move on to the next section. Um, 
Do you know about locust trees and if they're more immune to bugs and disease than other trees? Uh, like honey locust trees, um, they, <laughs> everything gets something. It's just a matter of how bad it looks. So locust trees can get, um, there's a fungus that they get if you prune them when it's damp out. Um, they can get like leaf hoppers and, and things like that. But as far as, ooh, as far as I know, I don't think they have any borers. Um, yeah. And I don't recall having seen any fungal activity, activity on locust trees. Um, in my experience, locusts are, are pretty tough in the what env whatever environment you put them in for the most part. And I haven't seen much pest damage. And what I have seen has all been essentially aesthetic. So I don't know if you're thinking about plant planting a locust, I would recommend it. I think they're cool. <laughs> Excellent. And they say thank you. All right. Yeah, that's what we have for now. Um, so I guess the uh, final slide here when thinking about pruning, we want to make sure we're being safe, um, making sure we're using the right tool for the job. Please, whatever you do, do not get on a, a ladder with a chainsaw. <laughs> that is, that's not what we need to be doing. If it gets too big or you're not sure, hire an arborist. Um, if we are pruning, make sure we're using good pruning practices, cutting back to appropriate places on the trees. If you're removing something big, please do use that three cut method and encourage healing. Make sure we are pruning at, at a good time. And I think that also relates to how healthy the tree is. Um, avoid cutting back to something that doesn't make sense or is an inappropriate place. And then just don't use tree sealant unless it's an oak. So that is <laughs> sort of a summation of, of the PowerPoint. Um, I realized that this is a different version of the PowerPoint than I usually use. So I forgot to mention this, but as a general rule of thumb, in terms of how much to prune, it depends on the age of the tree and if it is healthy or not. So the healthier a tree is and the younger a tree is, the more you can prune out of it. So if it is a young tree, we can do up to a third of the canopy. If it's a medium age tree, it's more like a quarter. And if you've got a big old oak tree, really you don't wanna prune anything out of it, but what's dead? Um, just because, you know, if it's smaller and healthier, it's more able to heal over things and keep trucking along and you're not making big cuts on it. If it's older, older trees are, you know, as they sort of reach a peak age and then they kind of start dying back a little and getting a little bit smaller because they can't support how big they got. So at that point, it just makes sense to not take away any of the live wood that it has. So um, there's that. And then uh, here, well, so if we want to try and do a poll now, we could do that. And then we, when we teach this class in person, we have this pruning exercise and so which branches would we remove? And I'll just put the answers up and then people can look at that and maybe do the poll at the same time, if that makes sense. And uh, Matt, do you have access to the poll? I think I might. Um, how do you go about doing that? I see where you set up a poll. Yes. Um, if you go to the poll, is there a preset poll already done or would you need to add information? It says no polls to launch. No polls to launch. I can create one from scratch, but other, you know, by going to the web portal, but it, it doesn't say there's anyone's out there to launch right now. Okay. Um, that's a group. Uh, Mariah, what do you think? I don't know um, the answer for it either. Kevin had said that he had preloaded it in, but I don't know if we got into the same account that he loaded those in at. Okay. Oh, let me take a look around. Okay, wonderful. Thank you.
And I'm on with the uh, District 10 login and it says there's no polls created. Let's see here. And we do appreciate everyone sticking around for whatever poll it is that we might end up doing. <laughs> yeah. um, well, they're working on that. Can I ask another a question? Please do. Yeah, so this is Lilac. So um, this is really more a question at my, at my grandma. So she has some really well-established Lilacs and then they had gone untended for a number of years and then my, they've gotten really, really tall basically. And my uncle pruned them, but I think that the way he pruned them only encouraged them to get really tall. So like I saw when you, you gave that example of like calling out about a third, mm -hmm. like, and I've heard lilacs are pretty resilient, but like if, if to cut them, if we cut them back, would it just start sending up shoots from the bottom or will like the lower parts of, of the branches start sending out new shoots or like what, any advice in terms of how to kind of bring those a little back down? <laughs> sure. Yeah. So, um, I think, you would have some pretty good success if you did the like remove the third like you just go go for it pick out the, the fattest oldest tallest stems that you don't want remove a third at a time and that that removal to the ground then they sprout from the ground um so then they would eventually get tall again but they're they'd start from the base again um the other thing you can do with lilacs if they're just out of control and you're over it they you can just cut the whole thing off at like six to 12 inches. Um, and then they'll just, just sprout from those stubs. Um, that, that feels really extreme. Um, but that is something that lilacs generally can handle. Otherwise, if you just take out the biggest, oldest stuff, the growth will be from the, like from the ground and won't be as huge. So if, if you're trying to do like a, a pruning cut like you would on a tree and bring it back down to a, like a different branch on the lilac then it's just going to sprout from there and so it would still be tall um so oh yeah for sure if you want to cut it down and not have it be as tall then cut it lower because that's where they sprout from okay cool thank you um, does this do you know if this diagram works for fruit trees This diagram that's up on the, the page? Yes, the pruning exercise. Um, I think parts of it are true for fruit trees in that we, if there's something that is crossing or rubbing, we wanna get rid of that. If it's dead or diseased, we wanna get rid of that. Um, but <laughs> there again, with fruit trees, if you are in it for fruit production, that's a whole different animal. Um, the extension has a lot of good resources on apples and grapes and kiwi vines and all of these things that are, are more specific to those species than um, what is said in this presentation. So I would suggest going to the extension website and seeing what you could see there about fruit trees. That's <laughs> Fruit trees are not my expertise, so. Okay, let's stop sharing my screen. Um, yeah, and if, if you have um, specific like use or other things like that, that you are seeking advice on, there is also um, whole pages on pruning in evergreens because that's a little bit different because they grow a little bit different. Um, so there's that. Oh, do you know what voles do to trees? So voles, the, uh, the biggest problem that I have encountered from voles is that they, they're, you know, like to the height of a, a vole, just nibble around the base of a tree. So they'll, you often see this after the snow melts, um, where 
they didn't have a lot to eat. So they just like made their little holes through the snow and they came and they nibbled the live tissue all the way around the base of the tree. And then the tree has a bad time because it's, it's, it's vascular system is just gone. So um, if you have ever seen, there's like blue plastic shelters that they'll put around new trees. And the idea with those is to try and keep the bowls out so they can't nibble the, the bark at the base. And I, I don't know if they interact much with roots, but that's what I have seen from bowls is they'll chew the bark off. And then we, we don't get that exchange of water and photosynthates throughout the whole tree. Um, let's see. Um, uh, there's um, uh, uh, someone has an, an over a huge overgrown uh, ver verburnums, mm -hmm. and they're advised to cut them back to the ground. Uh, is this the time? Is this the right time to do that correctly? Um, or and do they just cut every branch at the base? Um, <laughs> viburnums. There are a lot of things that count as viburnums. Um, so I don't want to steer you wrong, um, but if, if it is a shrub that will rejuvenate from the base, um, you can just cut, cut stems back to the ground. Um, I would leave maybe like a three inch stub because then there's some, some tissue there that the sprouts and things will come back from. And then I would, um, Oh, I'm not 100% sure on this, but I think that the time to do that is, oof, I think it's in the spring that we, um, because that's when like right before spring flush, because then that spring energy would help it reflush. But I would definitely suggest um, like looking at the extension website. Otherwise, something that we do when we're looking for answers is if you go into Google and you want a specific answer about something, if you type in site, S-I-T-E uh, colon E-D-U, and then your, your search term, then you'll, you'll get, get pulled up um, college websites and extension websites and things. And so that will be more scientific based rather than like home and garden says blah and not to say that they're wrong but that is a a good trick for finding good horticulture information okay fantastic um one one more question okay. so like with last summer's drought like mm -hmm. the the image you gave of the root system and it being further out that was new insight for me so thank you and like what's the best advice in terms of watering when we're having drought conditions when it comes to trees and shrubs so i trees are made to put roots where water can be so if it's an if it's an old tree thinking about the spread of that root system the amount of water you would have to put down so it wouldn't all get sniped by grass would just be absurd. And with that age, in theory, it should have those deeper roots or roots in sneaky places to get the water it needs. So in, I think it makes sense to just kind of let old trees be. Um, I mean, if it's really, really super drought stressed, maybe do something with it, but it would be a lot of water. Um, I would say, concentrate efforts on younger trees. Um, if it's a newly planted tree and it's droughty, I would water it the whole first year. Um, just go out there, stick your finger in the soil, see how it's doing. Um, and then like, yeah, medium trees, I think it's a, a case by case basis where, you know, if it's really stressed, maybe give it some water. Um, but with, with younger trees, it's easier because those roots are smaller. Um, they do have what's called gator bags, which you, you maybe have seen. It's these like two foot tall green things that zip around the base of a tree. And then you fill them with water and they slowly trickle the water out over a couple hours. Um, that's a good way to water a new tree. 
Um, they sell things like that that are similar, but like donut shaped that work pretty well for shrubs. Um, or um, like a, a drip hose situation. So I think the main thing with, with watering trees is that we, we want to encourage their roots to be down in the soil where they need to be. And so we want to water, water less frequently, but deeper um, so that it's, it's a longer, longer water cycle. And it is also dependent on you touching the soil, not necessarily doing it on like a, it's been three days sort of thing. So, um, and I think with things that water consistently, but kind of slower, so it um, sits in more. Um, and then if it's like, if it's not, sprinklers are fine, but I think that a lot of water gets wasted just flailing around. So if we get those like slow release bag sort of products, I think that gets the water more concentrated where it needs to be. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, these have all been really good questions and I hope everybody learned some things. Um, I just want to remind everybody that um, in the chat, we have links to um, this presentation and some class notes, um, if you want to keep those for later. And just a reminder that we've got other classes coming up constantly. So if you have other things you're curious about. And I went ahead and reposted them at the bottom, just in case if anybody came in after they were posted the first time. Perfect. And any more, uh, how's the poll going? Is that? Um, I am doing a cut and paste on it, but it does take a little bit of time. Is there a way that you could put something in the chat similar since I don't want people's having to stay around too long? Right. Um, or a link that, to maybe the poll on, on your website or something similar? Yeah, that is a new technical glitch like zoom always there's always like a new glitch like no matter how many <laughs> years we've been doing this um let me um otherwise I'll, I, i'm gonna keep continuing to cut and paste into a new poll here okay yeah um i'm gonna check on one thing and then um if and see if it, it should be less than two minutes we'll see how that goes though um okay sounds um, good so i'll be right back can I ask a non tree related pruning question to fill up this empty space? <laughs> I, uh, I'll do my best to answer it. Well, I always have a problem trimming my herbs, and my mm -hmm. herbs always die. Is it because I'm over trimming them? over pruning them like harvesting my herbs too soon so are you trying are you growing like oregano or something and you try and yeah just like try or... bits out to use and then hoping it just keeps going are you do you mm -hmm. overwinter them i haven't because they haven't survived the summer yet mm -hmm. um yeah i mean like last year we just bought like um uh, thyme and mint and oregano and some other ones and we transplanted them and, and probably thought it was nice to have and then tried to harvest them too soon. And then they didn't grow back after the harvest. So were you just like cutting off like a little bit, like I need a sprig and like taking that or were you taking like uh -huh. big chunks? Yeah. I don't know. That's, that's odd. I, I mean, Maybe I was taking too much. I, I don't know. I just, we're, we're getting ready to start doing it again. And I'm like, this is the year I'm going to keep them alive this year. Yeah, well, just and last year was tips. just such a weird year too. So I don't know. Oh, yeah. It, the drought situation was just not good for anybody. But mm. fair. I'll blame it on that then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I usually just let my herbs grow out and then harvest them at the end of the season. So sure. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I gave Brianna a quick call um, and then I emailed her um, just to see. I mean, she's usually like within seconds of responding with emails. 
So we'll see, because she also knows the class is going. Um, but we'll see if she's able to contact us, if she's able to come up with something quickly. Yeah, and I was looking at Shevik and Brianna's emails, and I it seemed like it was supposed to be loaded in pretty easily, but it doesn't appear that that's translated to the to the Zoom call today. Uh, so now is not too late to start pruning. Is that correct? Now, it like, it, and it's interesting looking at the the fluctuation of the temperatures. Like, you know, we have something going all the way up to forty degrees, and then it drops down to fifteen degrees. So is now too late to, you know, to like if you you have a neighbor's tree hanging over your fence line, for example. Um, so with the advice to prune in the late winter slash early spring, I know like as you're saying the weather, it doesn't make it easy to define these things, you know, considering we had a thunderstorm last night and woke up to snow this morning. Um, I would say if you are looking at something you're thinking about pruning, you can kind of see what their buds are doing. And so if you like, you know, they start off with little tiny buds. And then they get fatter and fatter as the spring goes on. And then eventually they, you know, they open and you start to see tiny baby leaves. So if we're aiming for that late winter slash early spring window, um, I'd say you do that before you want to try and get the pruning done before we see those buds break open and we start to see little leaves. Oh, so you can do it that late. Like you, like once you start seeing buds that's still okay but you don't you want to get it before the buds break open in general like these are all like kind of sweeping comments. yeah that's that's what yeah. makes sense to me and i know that you know some people feel feelings with you know especially now with maple uh, sap running like there are trees that bleed a lot when you cut them and so the tree will be fine but if you want to avoid that then you just have to know that that species does that and then prune earlier or later than that. So mm -hmm. it's very helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is hard to figure out what the weather is. It's like, well, you know, it was raining last night and then we woke up to like a whole lot of snow this morning. Mm -hmm. So I have oh. a question. Does, um, does tapping maple trees damage the tree? Um, yes, but only a little, <laughs> as far as I understand it. So, you know, putting the tap in, like, that's a little hole, but it's, you know, it's a hole that's interrupting that little space of that cambium layer. Um, but, you know, if, if people tap trees over the years, then they see that those holes are able to get wound wood around them. And so that flow is resumed um, in terms of taking sap out of the tree. Um, as far as I'm aware, the trees do okay. I'm, I'm sure that there's a point at which you can take too much sap out of a tree, but I, I would imagine someone who taps a tree would know because they'd have to have like 18 buckets, you know? So I think it's okay. And here's a fun fact. Um, you can make syrup out of basswood sap and birch sap also. And I think someone told me black walnut too, that I think that would probably taste kind of bad, but bonus facts. <laughs> so basswood and birch is what you said? Mm-hmm. Oh, there you go. Um, I think I've heard that basswood syrup is supposed to taste kind of like chocolate, but that's all, that's hearsay, so. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Oh. Here's a poll. So. All right, I put the first poll out there and now we'll start cutting and pasting. So I think people should be able to see that poll. Could anyone take a look? I, yeah. I can see it. I don't know. Yeah, it's yep. right there. It is there. Thank you, Mike. All right, I'm gonna start on the second. Okay. And we just, we like to collect this information to know who we're reaching out to with our classes and then that'll help us in the future figure out how to reach populations that we don't see very often so we appreciate input on these things
Yes, and there's just the one more poll, and that's just about like what you thought of the class, and if you appreciated the class, and if um, you know what you learned, like where your knowledge level was at the beginning, and then where it was after the class, and that's very helpful, so that we know that we're delivering um, the correct information to the correct uh, audience. Because if it's too basic or too advanced, then we would want to adjust that. Uh, Mara, have you done the uh, Minnesota Tree Inspector Program? I have not. Um, I have looked at it, but haven't acted on it. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that it is, it's unclear to me how much it's something that you are required to do things with because I think that if you are a certified tree inspector then there is a degree of the the DNR asking you to like look at things mm -hmm. um, but I I'm not sure I was just sort of wondering what um I saw I, I noticed um that the University of Minnesota has um a tree inspector course and I wasn't sure if that was something you had done or if that was something you had found, you know, very informative or so. Yeah, there's there's a lot of courses and certifications I've looked at but haven't done anything with yet, so. Right. <laughs> Tell me the end here, hang on just a bit. Thank you so much. If anyone is really uh, tree nerdy, the shade tree short course at the, the university is in two weeks. And that's uh, like a two day conference where they just talk about all sorts of tree related things. And I'm super excited about it. And there's a fair couple talks this year about um, diseases and oaks. And I'm, I'm looking forward to that, so. Very good. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I got an email about that. That looked very interesting.
so that you, if you're excited, have you been to one before or? Um, have... Yeah, I did, I did it last year and last year and this year are both virtual, which is, mm -hmm. it's okay. I think that it, it'll be more exciting when it's in person again. So then there's that, you know, person to person interaction. So everybody can hear what everybody else does professionally. So. Right. Bunch of tree nerds. <laughs> mm -hmm. I just read um, the the Master Gardeners had a book um, club, and we read um, Finding the Mother Tree. Oh, I want to read that book so bad. It's one of the best books I have ever read, um, and I listened to it as an audiobook um, mm -hmm. with my kids. And at first, they were like, "Oh, mom," and they got so into it, um, and they thought it was amazing. Um, and it is, she, she talks a lot about um, the communications between the trees and the roots. And it's, very, it's a very exciting book. She does an amazing job with it. That's good to hear. I hope to read it sometime this year. <laughs> yeah, no, she's, and she gives a, good, a great TED talk. Um, okay. So uh, yeah, Suzanne Simard is, uh, she's really amazing. So I had never found, I found myself and my kids were all very excited about trees and just like trees are amazing. I read that book last year too, and it is very, very good. I agree. Yeah. Well, I'll admit I only read it for the book club. It's not something that I was like, oh, okay. We're reading about trees. Oh, okay, sure. And then I was like, wow, this is amazing. So I, um, I manage a bookstore in St. Paul. So books are kind of my, domain but i recently read a book called the overstory that is mm. also sort of adjacently about trees and since then i've been down a rabbit hole and that was <laughs> on that journey so if you're on a tree rabbit hole have you read the golden spruce i haven't read that one it's about um there was a a sitka spruce off the coast of washington that was a totally healthy tree but its needles were yellow and it uh, is the story about how like this tree had really great importance in the community it was in. And there was a guy who was part of the logging industry and just was very unhappy with the logging industry. So he decided to just cut this tree down as a form of, of protest. Oh, wow. wow. Yeah, it's, it talks about like the early logging industry and the indigenous community out there and like how they've, you know, they've tried to, go you know take genetic material from that tree when it first got cut down and grow cuttings from it and how they just can't do it and the fact that this tree existed at all because it was yellow which is like not super functional for a plant but I would suggest it um the author is John Valiant Valiant mm -hmm. Valiant yeah cool Do you know if they, if, is the U offer anything similar um, fruit trees or is it mostly focused on shade tree? The, um, the shade tree short course is, it, so it, it changes every year, um, but I, in the, what I saw last year, what I saw this year, it didn't seem like there was a fruit tree portion to it. Okay. But the, uh, the second poll is out there. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, thank Big you so point. much for doing that. But there was the last question that's just a, a narrative that I couldn't uh, figure out quickly how to do that. So for anybody to add into the chat, please tell our presenter what uh, thing, what was the question? <laughs> uh, one I would thing they to, learned. Yeah, what, tell us one thing you liked about this class. So that's something to respond to in the chat that I can't get to right now when the poll's open. One thing you liked about the class, and I assume they'll take more than one thing if you'd like. <laughs> but apparently there's not one saying, what, would you, what did you dislike? <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit of a slanted poll here, folks. <laughs> I assume people are out. Yep, I see people taking the second. Good. 
we're just out here as volunteers we don't need people telling us we did bad <laughs> yeah that's right <laughs> yeah just remember that when you rate the zoom call today <laughs> <We're bunch> And if one of you two master gardeners could put your email in the chat, then I can uh, email the poll results to you. Oh, wonderful, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, do you have Brianna's email? Because you could email it to her. I do. Um, I have that too. Yeah, because she she's the one who deals with the poll stuff. So yeah, so that would that would be very that would be the perfect person too. So do you have it available, or do I you just, need it? I just sent it to Mike. He's appreciate it. We have it. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. You yeah, bet. Thank you. Well, thanks, everybody. Enjoy your afternoon. Yeah, Absolutely. Thank you so thanks. Much. You too. Take care, guys.